Hey everyone, it is George Kroos and welcome back to the first month of the Innovators Mindset Podcast in 2024. This is the highlights from January and so thank you for being here. Thanks for listening. We have some really wonderful guests and kind of clip some of their insights, some of the best of from this month. So I really hope uh, you enjoy it. But I always, as you know, like to start with a little intro. And the thing that I was thinking about, I actually weirdly just saw a video of myself speaking about the Disney Marathon and how great of an experience this was. But it made me think of something that I've thought about recently, and I might have thought about it during the run. When you run that long of a distance, there's so many things that go through your mind. And the thought that I had is going to really connect to some of the things that we do in education, even though it has to do with running. And I'll get to that in a second. The thought I had while I was running was when I lived in Canada, and it is cold. I've been getting weather updates from where I used to live, and it is freezing there, snow. I do not miss snow at all. I miss people. I don't miss snow at all. But I swore that if I ever got the opportunity to live in a warm climate, that I would run almost every day I could. And I don't run every single day, and not because I don't want to, but because I take a day off here and there so I could lift weights or do something else. I think that overrunning can cause more issues than it can solve. But I promised myself if I ever had the opportunity, I would run all of the time if I lived in a warm climate. And now I live in a warm climate and now I do it. So I was really proud of myself that even though I hadn't really thought about that, there was something I said I would do. And once I was given, if I was given an opportunity and once I had that opportunity, I did it. And the reason I share this with you and how this has to do with education, I want you to think back in particular this job you have, um, this circumstance you have, the circumstance you might want to get in the future. What is the thing you said you would do if you had what you had right now? And are you doing it? And if not, why not? And I think that's something I want you to think about. Because a lot of times we say, if only I could have this, and then we get that thing we wanted, but then we don't come through with the promises we made to ourselves. And that is something that I think is really important. Um, it's one of the conversations I was having with lots of uh, educators this past week at FETC was when we committed to what we were going to say we we're going to do in our interviews and in our jobs, did we actually come through with it? Did we actually come through with what we said? If you say, you know, I've been in education for 30 plus years, I don't need to learn new things. What did you say when you got the job on day one? That no matter what, I'll continue to learn, I'll continue to grow. If you get the opportunity to get some of the, I, I, and maybe that's the wrong way to say it. If you get the opportunity to create a space where you, you could do what you said you'd always want to do, will you do that thing? And I'm proud that I've committed to something, I have the opportunity, and now I'm doing it. So it's just something I want you to think about. And, you know, if that's the worst advice you get in this podcast, because it's only going to get better after this because I have really great guests but I hope it made you think and if not I promise you there's gonna be some really great stuff after the intro right here welcome back to another episode of the innovators mindset podcast I I've always approached it from I'm just sharing ideas with you you got to figure out your solutions because I don't know your kids I don't know your context but you do that in a really good way it, like are you cognizant of that how do you kind of go through that approach of really kind of, you know, sharing some insights about administration, even though you're doing it from the role of a teacher? Yeah. Um, first of all, everyone wants to be seen and acknowledged for what they're good at and what they know. And the, the converse is true as well. We, we don't want to be told how to do anything by people who don't do what we do. And this is why when you find out somebody does what you do, if you, let's say you've got, you know, two daughters and a son, you meet somebody else with two daughters and a son. Right. And you're like, Oh, okay. We, I mean, we, we get this, we know what this is like together. And, and I think that, um, in education, we at in, entirely educators, admin staff, we all suffer from a large cultural belief that anyone can tell us how to do our job. Like that's something that we can all kind of cling together on. Like whether you're a principal or you're a teacher, you've met somebody in the grocery store who thinks they know how to do your job better than you. So that already doesn't feel great. 
from my perspective, I've been a teacher now for almost 25 years. Um, I have been interested in teacher leadership from the beginning, but and I'm going to do the biggest uh, compliment I give to administrators, I think. Um, the job has always intimidated me to become an administrator. You know, I can if I want to. And I think early on in my career, I would say things like, ah, I don't want to become an admin. I mean, that's like going to the dark side. No, it's actually I, I totally see it a different way, especially after doing this work. Great administrators, great leaders in education. I think they're the most important leaders in any field anywhere. The, the impact that they have, the, the ripple effect, if you will, through their teachers and then through their students, it's massive. So, you know, when Ryan O'Hara and I uh, put together, you know, the ideas of this book and we started working on it together, we actually realized that at least one of us had to become an administrator or it would be just a, an act of hypocrisy to write this book. Right. I mean, the only thing we could say is, and, and I do say this to people, is like, well, I can tell you what it's like to be a teacher under administrators. And I think there's some really valuable info, info to that. We could probably come back around to it if we want to, George. Um, but what Ryan and I wanted to do is what would happen if an administrator and a teacher wrote something together? And I still don't see this happening anywhere. I mean, I see people who've left the classroom work right. together. But I am, I mean, I literally taught the last few pages of Cormac McCarthy's The Road today. We're reading Antigone in my ninth grade class. That happened today before I talked to you. Right. And so what I'm trying to bring is the side of the conversation, which is on the receiving end of what administrators do. But I have to tell you, I don't think there's a tougher job in the game, like a superintendent, a principal of a of a school that's got a lot going on with a real diverse community. There's not a harder job in education. There's not much of a harder job in leadership. So I have a lot of respect for people who do admin. And I hope that comes through with my work, because to tell you the truth, um, a great leader in a school literally can change the world in a way that a teacher can, but with such a bigger impact, you know? Well, because you, you know, as an administrator, you affect all the teachers that affect the kids, right? Like I, I, and it's, it's interesting you say this because, uh, we, Allison Apps and I just put together a book called what makes a great principal. And we share our insights, Oops. you know, from, uh, being principals. And even in the beginning, one of the things I shared that was really important to me, I didn't want to write the book because I thought I was a great principal. I wrote the book because I had a great principal. And I knew how much of an impact that made on me. And like it, it, it not only just changed my thoughts on education, it, it literally changed my life. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, you know, and I'm proud because you said, I haven't really seen anything like this because except for now it's coming out is our book actually isn't just sharing this insights from principals. We asked teachers and students to talk about really effective principles, what made them effective and actually really kind of what like give people strategies because a lot of times we say you know we got to really hear from the people we serve but then those books actually come from kind of a top-down approach but i'm like no, no no let's hear from the people we serve and when we were going through that process we have um 15 people writing chapters um on these five pillars and you were uh probably the, actually you were the first person i thought of and hmm. it's weird because i didn't i don't and we have incredible people, um, but I, I just know your work really intimately. And, and it was kind of funny because as we were talking here today, I was like, now I know why, because just how you talk about it, man, but you don't do it in a condescending way because you know, when someone says, oh, that's how you make the big bucks. It's like, okay, well, I guess it's okay. I feel crappy. Like, you know, do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's not, it's, it's not really helping anybody. And I, I've always tried to talk about how you lead up. Like sometimes you do have a crappy administrator mm -hmm. and that's a reality. Like I'm not pretending you don't, but yeah. just saying they're crappy and then being miserable, it's not helping anything. Oh, I, one of the stories I wanted to tell just again, like it is a tool. People are going to use it. It's like, how do we use it responsibly without losing our human skills, our innovators mindset, right? You don't want to shift that. And so we were boom, boom, boom. So we were playing around, Pat and I, right? And um, we were talking about this before we went on air here about uh, a little mishap I had where I um, traveled to a presentation. I was about to give a keynote and I was getting ready in the morning and it was just a one day. So I had like a backpack and I was like, oh, here's my cute sweater that I rented. And, you know, here's my cute heels and like, oopsie, where are the pants that I rented? And they never made it. So I had like the sweatpants I wore on the plane and didn't have anything else, right? And at this point, like 
I have to think critically, right? So, you know, I'm there in the morning and I was like, oh my gosh. So I was like, okay, Katie, like you got this, right? Like, what are my options? See if somebody left something in the hotel, you know, um, lost and found. Maybe I could see if there was like a store open at 5 a.m. Like, is there a 24 hour place that sells pants? You know, I could write to like the school administrator and be like, how tall are you? Are you at least five, eight? Um, <laughs> and so, right, I have all these plans and I'm like, all right. So like I did my brainstorm, right? That's like the pre-writing, right? So I like go down to the hotel. I'm like, hey, anything in the lost and found? Any like waitresses that work here? Do you have uniforms? And I'm like, no. Turns out there was a 24 hour Walmart. And so I, you know, took an Uber to the Walmart showed up right I mean the pants there I'm telling you they were like 12 bucks and they were awesome so um the whole thing I solved the problem right and it's like I kind of was like laughing my way through it being like I will figure this out right so it's like the reflection it's the problem solving it's the critical thinking right so we were joking about it we told a little anecdote about it and so just out of curiosity we're like imagine if we didn't have the ability to think critically and we just became to rely only on chat GPT. And so I put it in and I was like, I am at a hotel. It is five o'clock in the morning. I have to do a big presentation. What should I do? And I kid you not, if I was dependent on this to do thinking right. for me, it told me to go to the presentation in the hotel robe, in the <laughs> robe. And I was like, can you imagine? Like if I, and it's such a perfect example of like, what can happen? Like if I didn't practice, right. you know, critically thinking and I was just like, okay, okay. Like, I mean, that would have been my last presentation right there. Right. If I go rolling in. Or your first and with a very answer. different audience. <laughs> I would like to be clear. Um, if anybody listening, the fact that these pants did not make it into Katie's backpack was not the fault of Rent the Runway. I was going to say. A, uh, it was a, a oh, no, oh, no, no. Oh, no. Rent the Runway. As our sponsor. Oh, no. Sponsored by Rent the Runway. Them. I texted them. They just didn't make the cut. Um, and so, turns out, but like, if you think about that on a large scale, like, if that's an allegory for what could go wrong, it's like, if we <laughs> don't witness and scaffold these critical thinking skills in front of us, we are going to have a group of people who only rely on the robots to make decisions. And like, that is not the most responsible decision, you know, in the old education space. The most inspiring and motivating piece of the whole course for me was the feedback. When you would, when um, an assignment was due and we posted something, you would not only read it, you would also share with us strengths or compliments, but then you'd also give us additional things we could dig deeper in. We could go further with our work. Um, and I couldn't wait to get that feedback from you. I was more yeah. excited to get the feedback than I was to see I got a one out of one on the assignment mm -hmm. for a grade. It was really for me not about the grade. And I think that's a mindset shift that a lot of um, adult educators are starting to make. Mm -hmm. um, that it's not about the grade it's about the process and what yeah and what you put into the course is what you get out of it so um yeah I would highly encourage any adult educator in any aspect um whether you're a para a teacher um an administrator to, mm -hmm. to take the course. well that and like I I've been trying to think about the terminology that I want to use with this because it's it's like conversation as assessment you know, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if that's the right terminology, but the, so just to kind of, for people that maybe don't really understand this part, they're the one that Allison's referring to, basically the only mark you could get was one. <laughs> like there is no 0.8 point, there's one, it was one out of one, right? And the reasoning behind that is if it's like an A, B, C, whatever, it's the same mentality that educators can have this really easily. They just look at the grade and ignore the, the comments or the conversation. And so when you just kind of know, like, that's going to be there, then you do start to kind of dig in. And, and the, I think the thing that's really important for me, and I, I was really are, you know, try to articulate this as best as possible, but it is different. And this is, you did this so well, and so did everyone in the class, to be honest with you, it was, um, it was like, you all have your own experiences, 
you have your own jobs, take the content and mix it into your current work. So for me to say like, hey, you're like an instructional coach. I've never been an instructional coach, but I'm going to grade you on your ability to be an instructional coach doesn't make any sense to me because I don't know the role. So that I think that's why it's like, hey, here's some perspectives. And you know, I don't maybe this will help you a little bit. Um, the other thing too, and I, I, I'm going to call, I don't know if I'm calling you out. I don't want to make you feel bad at all. You were late with some assignments. Right, and, yeah. and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I was the, the, if you say like, here's a hard deadline. And if you don't get it in by this time, you lose grades. Then I guarantee you, if I would have said that to you, just kind of knowing your personality, you would have got it in on time, but then it wouldn't have been as good. And when you know, like, hey, like I got stuff going on, I actually want to put effort into this. Then, like, you're everything you like. There is nothing I was like, oh, this felt rushed by you. Do you know what I mean? And so that's that's why I do it that way. Is because sometimes people are more concerned about the deadline than the the effort and the con of the content. Does that mean, like I don't know if that makes sense how I kind of frame that, but like, and it was like, and by the way, I'm not giving Allison heck. <laughs> for doing this like it was very clearly articulated like you don't have to message me you don't have to like ask for an extension just try to get it around this time and if you need more time because as you said life happens then but i just want really good stuff that was the biggest intent not i want it on time it was i want good stuff and if it's not on time i'd rather have good stuff you know what i mean yeah and that was very well articulated because that's exactly how i felt i'm like well i could rush and get this done tomorrow right. or I could do something that I'm really actually going to use and bring back to my school. And as much as I love the, the race, I really love the training. I feel that I've become a better learner through this. I've become maybe even more disciplined through the process, but there's something that I knew was coming. Cause I, I had run a marathon. I've run a couple before I ran when I was 29. I ran when I was 30 and I committed to, running one in every decade of my life. And I ran one in my twenties, I ran one in my thirties and I waited 18 years to do one in my forties. So I, you know, hopefully I'm in shape to, to do it in my fifties. I can, you know, finish that process. And, uh, it took me 18 years, but I did it. And I'm really proud that I went through this, but there's this thing that after you work so hard towards something, and this could be, I feel this is actually really applicable to teachers. Cause I didn't realize I was having this when I was teaching, um, but it's a thing called runner's depression. And what runner's depression is, is that you work so hard toward a goal and then you achieve it. And then right after, even through the stress, through the exhaustion of running toward a goal, then all of a sudden you kind of wake up and you don't feel like you have much of a purpose. And it's not that you don't, it's just you feel you don't because what am I doing today? Like, what am I training for? You like, everything is geared towards this. And I, I realized when I was teaching, I, I had felt that quite a bit too. You, you know, you're just overwhelmed, exhausted, and you're trying to get to that end of the year, trying to get the best out of every person that you're working with, with your kids, your staff, whoever. And then you're looking forward towards summer and having some time off and then you're just like, I don't know what to do with myself. And that that's a little bit of runner's depression. That's probably what that is because you feel you're working towards something. You finally get to that end point. And then you, even with the time to relax, it's hard. And I have always struggled with relaxing. And the reason I'm bringing this up, I was listening to Bill Simmons. I probably my favorite podcast to listen to has nothing to do with education. It's just sports. And when I run, I want, I don't want to think about anything deep. I just want, I, I'm going to list, like, sometimes I listen to books to learn and things like that. But honestly, I've been doing a lot of sports stuff because it's enjoyable. I get a couple of laughs out there. And every now and then there's something that I'm like, that's a really great point. That's really um, something that connects with me. And there is one thought I had from my run yesterday that I cannot get out of my mind and it really struck me and it's connected to this idea of runner suppression. Uh, Bill Belichick, who was the head coach of the New England Patriots, considered to be the greatest football coach of all time. 
Uh, now, there's some debate because he had Tom Brady. Tom Brady's the greatest quarterback. That's kind of undisputed now. Uh, he's the greatest winning quarterback, that's for sure. He's won the most Super Bowls. But uh, Bill Belichick would won all those titles except for the one with Tampa with Tom Brady. And he had just uh, they had, he had just parted ways with New England. And Bill Simmons is a huge Boston sports fan. And so he knows them inside out. And he said something about how much Bill Belichick loved the process. And he sp- specifically said that him and Tom Brady had that same mentality. And Tom Brady, I think he had won seven Super Bowls. Like no team has won as many Super Bowls as Tom Brady as an individual. That's how successful he is. And it's either six or seven. I'm pretty sure it's seven. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it's seven. And when Tom Brady was asked what was his favorite Super Bowl, his answer is consistent. The next one. 